Well, a warm welcome to everybody this morning. We're glad to see you here. And uh, we're going to start with a hymn of praise, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Aren't you glad God's grace far exceeds our sin? And this gives us a chance to uh, sing praise to him for that and uh, start the day on the right thought. So let's stand together and sing about marvelous grace. standing for the reading of scripture and prayer. Hey, good morning. I'm going to read this morning from uh, Psalms 95, 1 through 7. O oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout it joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he was who made it. And his hand formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for opening the eyes of us who know you. It's awesome to be able to know you and know that you created everything and we are yours. 
especially in a time of strife, in trials and tribulations. The good news about that is we know we're on the right road because you said that's the right road or that would happen. We praise you and worship you in our songs and prayers. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Well, good morning. Welcome to Spencerport Bible Church. Glad to see you all here. And glad to have you if you're watching online. I pray you'll all be blessed today. Just a few things I want to highlight today. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll have our monthly prayer meeting right here at the church at 7 o'clock this morning. Pastor Don normally leads that. But he's going to be the subject of some of our prayers. <laughs> and Barry's going to take over leading the, the meeting. Uh, and, and along that line, uh, Pastor Dom, along with a, a team with Rescue and Revive, are on a mission trip to Uganda and Kenya. And pray that you, you just keep them in your prayers as you uh, are uh, thinking of him. Uh, I know they're, they're working to, to plant churches, to uh, spread the gospel, and bring hope in Uganda and Kenya. And Tuesday night, or sorry, Wednesday night, we have a video devotional. Uh, you can watch online. You can come here in person. Uh, Tom's on the on the docket, but it might be Barry. We'll see how things go. <laughs> They're both ready to to have something to share Wednesday night. Reminder of the evening uh, Thanksgiving evening service, November twenty second, six to seven thirty. And then I just have a few prayer requests I wanted to highlight today. Uh, you know, Candy and Mark are moving, and they've got a lot to do, and they've got to get it all done today. <laughs> They're not so much looking for help, but they want your prayers, that they'd be able to get it all done and do it well. Uh, we'll pray for Janet. She's doing well, and she may actually get out of the hospital this week. That means that there's a lot of other arrangements that have to come together. So pray that you know, all the things would come together that need to come together, that she'd be ready to be out of the hospital and continue on. Continue with her healing. And lastly, uh, I want prayer for my adventurous daughter. She, uh, she got into with a group of folks that, that love to go and have destination birthday parties or whatever, you know, weddings. And so they travel far-flung places. Well, it was their turn to plan, and uh, they planned a trip for a birthday party in Nepal. And so they're out in Nepal and they were in Kathmandu, and they went off on their, in the middle of nowhere, mountainous stuff, and then there was an earthquake Friday night. And so uh, the earthquake took out all of their internet capabilities, I think, uh, for a while, so we, we haven't heard from her. So we're a little concerned. Um, pray also that, if, if, you know, that this might be the event that she needs to, to hear from the Lord and, and turn to him. So. Keep uh, Rachel and Evan in your prayers. And with that, if the men could come forward for the offering. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, we're so thankful to be able to come together and worship you this morning. Lift up your, your name in, in song and hear your word. And I pray that we find encouragement and strength in all that. And we pray for uh, Candy and Mark as they're doing all that work today to get moved. And yeah, pray that they would uh, just find you there and find you are helpful, that you are worthy of uh, putting our strength and our, our hope in. And Lord, pray for Janet as she's continuing to heal and pray for all the logistics that have to come together uh, for her to be living on her own. And uh, just uh, so thankful for her, uh, her good spirit her trust in you, and her good testimony. I'm going to pray for Rachel and Evan. Pray that, that your hand would come to them, that they would see that you are a mighty God and see that you are taking care of them and just preserve them through this, uh, this time. And now, Lord, we, we thank you for the way you support this church and take care of us. We see your hand all the time in the various things that go on here. And it's uh, good to to remember how strong and powerful you are. And we're thankful for everything you give us. Pray in your son's name, amen.
Cabrera, coming to us from Bethel Church. Why don't you guys come on up and we'll uh, worship the Lord together. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're able to, please stand with us as we worship our Lord and Savior. So good to be here today. I was born. Still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. Out of the darkness to your glorious day, you called my name.
Oh, thank you for the price you paid, Jesus. Every sin is washed away. So let it rise. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. And hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away, Hosea. find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Let's sing that again. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. God, we thank you that we serve a living God. All the other gods, all the other idols have no power. But we serve the one and true resurrected King, seated on the throne, Jesus Christ. Oh, we worship you because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because. They called him Jesus, he came to love, he 
heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because He I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I skip down to verse 3 and then one day and then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight by sign no more with me and then as death gives way starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every strong. Fire. 
Let's sing that again. Your name. Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name, only you. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break Every stronghold shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. So one more time, just the keys in our voices, your name. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through. We are in this morning uh, going to be spending a little time in the uh, Psalm uh, 73. And uh, first I want to say thanks for the, the uh, praise music. I love that, that particular one that says every day is worth living because of Christ. And uh, I particularly wanted to mention that because it goes right along with the message that we're going to find in Psalm 73. Uh, that uh, um, when you say the life is worth living and, and you have more to say about that than just that, you might use the word um, uh, nevertheless. Christ is here with us. Christ is here. Christ, Christ makes every day a day worth living. Uh, and what you heard me just do was combine uh, two narratives or two thoughts and, and tie them together with this word nevertheless. You see in the bulletin that the title for today's uh, uh, study is nevertheless. And... Uh, you say, that's kind of an odd thing to have for a title. Well, it probably is. But you know what? I looked and there are just tons of uh, God's use of that word in his word. Nevertheless, I didn't count them, but there was two pages full of references uh, of where 
God used that word, nevertheless. So I thought, man, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and I noticed also that nevertheless is kind of a, uh, has a connotation to it that builds expectation in what the person is saying. You know, uh, if uh, I started a, a, a little bit of a story and said, you know, the weather outside is frightful. You know, it's snowing and it's cold and it's dangerous. Nevertheless, what do you expect next? Could be something positive, could be something negative. But it's terrible outside. Nevertheless, we grabbed our ice skates and had a great time. You know, or it could be something negative follows that nevertheless. You've got two thoughts in process, trying to meld together and make one. So you make this one incomplete statement, and then you follow it up with, the details, what makes that, that first part make sense and have an application. And uh, Psalm 73 does just that very thing. It starts out with uh, one message in mind, one narrative uh, in the thoughts. And then uh, you go through it and you come to this word, nevertheless. You've got your Bible open to Psalm 73? You'll notice um, in Psalm 73, nevertheless doesn't come into the picture until uh, we get to uh, verse 23. But what follows from 23 down to 28 is the other end of the narrative that was covered in the first part of that chapter. And uh, what was covered in that part of the chapter is what we were singing about. Every day is worth living. Nevertheless, in other words, there's going to be something in this message that follows that thought, and that nevertheless doesn't come till 23. So, um, nevertheless uh, uh, has a meaning to it. And if you look on good old Mr. Webster, you're going to find out that nevertheless could be uh, used uh, in different words by saying, uh, in spite of that, so you make this part of narrative, and then you say, in spite of that. Or you say, however, and you finish your, uh, the completing thought. Or you could even say, on the other hand. <laughs> Here's a passage of scripture that spells out, and I'm going to give you the, do you like hearing the end before you read the book? In a sense, I'm going to do that with this chapter. He's going to basically, if I summarize the whole chapter, you could summarize it by this way. Man's in trouble. He's always been in trouble. He's in trouble now, and he's going to be in trouble in the future. However, nevertheless, there's Jesus Christ. He's the answer to them all. That's the message of this whole psalm. Our troubles are opportunities for God to work in our lives in a way that he teaches us who he is and we demonstrate who he is to people who don't know. That's the, we could stop right now and I'd say, think on that and read through this uh, chapter yourself and you'll see how those two tie together. Uh, one thought, uh, the one I was telling you about first, is that man's in trouble. Uh, when I think of that, I always think of uh, a verse out of Job. You talk about someone who knew what trouble was. If you're familiar with the story of Job, uh, you know uh, what he went through uh, was enormous, more than anyone else I've ever seen go through things except for the Lord himself. And uh, here he, uh, Job makes this comment, and it may make you scratch your head a little bit, uh, because he says this, uh, that um, uh, man is, this is uh, Job 5, verse 7, man is born for trouble. You believe, did you know that? Do you believe that? Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. What is he getting at when he, Job says that? He's saying man's always got troubles on his plate. And he says, as, as sparks fly upward, 
you ever build a bonfire at night? You know, you're going to roast some dogs or something, and you get it cranked up real nice and hot, and the fire starts burning, and then it starts to pop and, and make sounds, and all of a sudden you'll see the sparks flying up. You know, that's normal and natural for a fire, that it creates sparks that fly heavenward, that fly upward. He says man's born to trouble just like it's, and that's normal, and it's just like a fire sending sparks out, and the sparks go upward. Another way you could say it is man's naturally surrounded with troubles. Are you surprised by your troubles that you've got some? A lot of times troubles come into my life and I'm surprised by them. But uh, the other side of that same story is this. Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. But God is the answer to all the sparks. He's the answer that, that he provides. Uh, we ought to naturally go to him when troubles enter our lives. It's that normal. If you want to call it normal. Your life has always had... Listen, when you came into this world, you came in troubled. You were probably cold at first, and then someone wrapped you up and took care of you, got warm. And so you got over it. Now you expect to be comfortable. When you came into this world, you uh, could see food, but you couldn't get to it. You couldn't eat it. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, handle uh, getting that food from the plate to yourself. Or, and, but, you know, that troubled you. You probably yelled and screamed and uh, threw a fit until someone fed you. And then over the passage of time, you kind of figured it out little by little, and eventually you could feed yourself. Now that trouble is gone. You couldn't feed yourself. You came in with a problem. That problem was learned from and, and overcome, and then it's not there anymore. You don't think, does anybody here think that they're going to have trouble eating this afternoon? If you went to this steakhouse, you wouldn't be able to feed yourself. You don't worry about that anymore. There was a time in your life when uh, you, couldn't, you could see other people moving around and doing things, and you thought to yourself, oh, I'd like to do that. And uh, you can't do that. So you started to work on it. And that trouble, you'd start by creeping around and pulling up on things. You know what I'm saying. You learn to walk. Now, do you ever worry about not being able to walk? Well, until you get to my age, you might wonder. But no, you don't worry about walking anymore. That was a, a problem that uh, got fixed, and you no longer think about it. And I could go on and name other examples that we come into this life without. We worry about it until it gets fixed, and then we don't worry about it anymore. You know there's a spiritual application to that. When you're born again and you just come to know the Lord and have an intimate relationship with him, did you come into salvation fully blown knowledge of God and his ways and his works and his word? No. No is the right answer. Why? Because you don't know it. It's something that's a problem to you at the moment. But God is the answer for getting to know him intimately. God is the one who will teach you what his word means. God is the one who will take your experiences of life and make them a gone away problem. Man is, man is surrounded by problems, but you're also surrounded by God, the answer to the problems. God wants us to know that. And so he, one of the things he did here was give us a nevertheless uh, lesson. And he chose a man named Asaph to do it. If you don't know who Asaph is, and you must, if you're going to understand this, this chapter in God's word, Asaph uh, was a, a Levite. That is, he was a, a priest 
in Israel. He was, and I'm going to say he was a godly man, because I have some evidence here that tells me this. He was a servant of God, but he was a servant of God who uh, uh, also was a man with open vision. He was looking around while he was serving God and knowing God. He was watching the world all around him, and he came up with some conclusions that were a problem to him. Did you ever do that? He came up with this problem. And uh, let me also tell you a little more about him. He was one of three men, heads of three families, that were chosen in the days of David to be the uh, musicians that take care of the temple worship. They were the instrumentalists. They were also the singers, like our friends this morning. They, their ministry was, uh, Asaph's ministry was, he was the head of, uh, uh, of the, the temple's music and songs uh, that would be used for, uh, for other people and themselves to, uh, to worship. He was, um, scripture tells us that he was a musician and that he was, he was a percussionist. We would call him probably a drummer today because he was expert with the use and the playing of cymbals. That's what his job was. So, uh, and so uh, he, was, he was that in, in a ministry, but he also had a writing ministry. God spoke through him. He wrote 12 of the Psalms in, in your book of Psalms. He wrote, he wrote 12 of them. And uh, he wrote Psalm 50, and then he wrote Psalm 73 through 83. That's the Levitical uh, portion of Psalms. And he wrote those. He was a man who walked with God. He knew God, yet he had eyes open and was watching society and mankind around him. And uh, to tell you something else about him is when that point in history, when Israel had spent 70 years, or Judah had spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity, that, that 70 years came to an end. And once it came to an end, uh, a return was allowed uh, to come back out of Babylon and go uh, back and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Well, they got the, uh, the walls built, and then they started on the um, foundation for the temple. And at that time, Asaph brought 128 singers. That's a pretty good-sized choir, wouldn't you say? 128? He brought them all the way from Babylon down to Jerusalem, where the temple uh, foundation was being laid. And he brought them down, not to do more than one thing. He brought them down to work, to labor, and to lead and have a ministry in the music uh, with the people there. They were an encouragement. I'm telling you all this just to uh, say this. Asaph was a good guy. He was a godly guy. And we were just reading that all men come to life with troubles. Even the good guys? Even the good guys. Christians have troubles. But Christians have the answer to troubles. Those without him don't. So uh, we're going to emphasize here uh, that uh, Asaph, he had troubles, and listen to his trouble. Now if you look in uh, Psalm 73, you see that uh, uh, here at verses 1 through 3, uh, he says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me... My feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Here's a believer, a walker with God, who is saying, he almost messed up. He almost failed in, uh, in life here. And uh, before we go any farther, let's have just a quick word of prayer because uh, I wanted to get to this point before we prayed because we got fixed in our mind right now that even Christians have troubles. 
but God is the answer. However, or nevertheless, God has the answer for him. Let's pray. Father, we just take a moment. We wouldn't approach your word without first approaching you. We know it's the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. You've told us that very clearly. And Lord, we can't figure things out ourselves. We need his counsel in our minds and in our hearts, in the depths of our soul where decisions are made. We need your counsel. So at this time, as we continue to look at your word here in this uh, chapter um, of uh, Psalms, we pray that you'll use it to do that for each one of us. May it make a difference in the how we face the trials, the troubles of our life, uh, because they're worth going through. Each one of them means you're teaching us something special. So we commit this to you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Now we turn our attention to thy word again in, and enjoy it in Jesus' name. So at verses 1 through 3, uh, I uh, see here that uh, Asaph, a good man, has a problem to the degree, he says here, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. He almost did wrong. He almost uh, 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 comes short of who he should be uh, in his relationship with the Lord. My steps had almost slipped. My way of life had almost slipped. You want attention to this one fact, though, before we go on. He says, uh, my feet came, did he say he stumbled? Or did he say he slipped? No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says, my feet came close to stumbling. And my steps had almost slipped. I wonder what happened, what stopped the stumbling? What caused it to fail? Why didn't he slip? That's what we're going to be looking for as we go on down through here and get, find out some answers. Because uh, Asaph had a problem. And in uh, these two verses, we see that, that he worried about those things uh, because he says in verses, now go over to verse 21 and 2, that relates to this same thought. He says, when my heart was embittered, uh, so there's the problem. He had a bitter heart. I was pierced within. That is, uh, have you ever had something that made your heart sick? That's kind of what he's uh, pointing to here. I was pierced within. You, you almost have a, a, a pain in your heart as if you were being wounded by a sword. Some, sometimes the sharp pain is right Right in, right in your upper body, right in your upper uh, portion there. And he goes on to say, I had a bitter, I had a, a, a heart that was bitter, and I, it was making me sick. It was making me hurt. It was making me uh, uh, f feel pain that I had never felt before. So he's saying here uh, that uh, this bitter heart uh, just kind of brought out uh, the worst in his inner being. Well, what made him bitter? Well, uh, verses 21 and 22 says this. He was embittered uh, and he was pierced within. When? When? Here's a time word in the beginning of, of the next verse, verse uh, uh, 22. Then, when this was going on, he said, I was two things. I was senseless and I was ignorant. Now, those are, that's what was happening. He was senseless and he was ignorant. You know, that's not the same. That's two different things. What's happening when a person is senseless? A person that's senseless knows something. They have knowledge, but they don't know how to put it together. They don't know how to make it work. We call that wisdom. He says, when my, what was making me bitter was that um, I was senseless. That is, I didn't know how to take the truth of God's word. I didn't know how to take the knowledge of God 
and uh, understand it and put it together with wisdom and actually live it. But he says that was one problem. The other problem was I was ignorant. <laughs> ignorant doesn't mean stupid. Ignorant means uh, you've never been taught it. You know, if you raised up a child and you, and you uh, kept him out of math class, he would never learn math. Well, it's not because he's stupid. It's because he never was taught. He never got to learn it. So, the, uh, so Asaph here says, what was making his heart bitter? He says what there, there was, he was lacking wisdom and he was lacking some knowledge he ought to have by then. You catch that in verse 22? And uh, so uh, his heart was painful with feelings. If it was an emotional thing, we might have, uh, we might have heartburn. This is kind of, maybe you want a new term? Do you ever have soul burn? <laughs> you know, eating the wrong things will, might give you heartburn, but focusing your understanding on the wrong things without wisdom and being ignorant in, in knowledge of God and so on, that will give you soul burn. And it's painful. Man's always, you've heard that statement about every man has a God-shaped void in their heart. You've heard that? And that, so man's out there looking for an answer for his pain, and he can't find an answer for his pain because he's failing to look to God. Until he finds God, will that heart pain ever be taken care of. Same uh, thing we need that uh, we find in Asaph's life was uh, his trouble too, and it was making him uh, almost animal-like. Um, in these same two verses, uh, you see that he, at the end of verse 22, he says, I was like a beast before thee. What's a beast like? Beasts don't go to school. Beasts learn things, they do, they do uh, but they, they perform and do things uh, not by thinking through them and reasoning. They do things based on instinct, what God built in them to is a natural response to their lifestyle. So he says, I was kind of like that. I was, I was being led by the things of those around me and nature around me that uh, instead of the one Lord and God I should have been taught by and led by. So he says, I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast uh, before thee. Uh, you know, uh, I think sometimes Christians, uh, sometimes we live by instinct. We don't live by wisdom, that is going to God regularly and getting his uh, input for what I'm going to be doing today. Instead, I go through my day all under my own control, all under by obeying my desires and uh, hoping God blesses it. See, that's the wrong way. That brings soul pain, soul burn. Uh, when we don't have his wisdom and his wherewithal to handle life, especially the problems. So um, uh, here he's, he uh, is answering and telling us about the cause of his problem. His problem uh, basically came from looking around at society around him. He was serving God in his, as he should and so on, but he was noticing a lot of people who claimed to be worshiping God living in the wrong ways. And they would brag about it. And they would boast about it. And they would tell, have, uh, have how much uh, it's been a profitable issue to them in their life by following their own desires and their own plans and purposes. You could call that spiritual myopathy. Myopathy. How much, did I get that right? Myopathy. Uh, vision that's only good for the close near and by. It's not seeing far away, but it's a, uh, a, a problem called myopia to uh, be short-sighted because the world around is not looking at life 
from God's point of view. Because God's point of view says life is everlasting, life is eternal. Life, even for the unbeliever, their life is not going to end. It's going to have a different destination than yours, but their life won't end. They have an eternal, they will never cease to exist. And the world doesn't believe that. They don't think that. They think they're like dogs that, uh, or an animal that will just die and you bury them and they're gone. There's, they don't have life anymore. That's not true of man. He designed us in his likeness. We live forever. Even the unsaved is going to live forever. That's why they ought to give it some thought, but they don't. They plan their life as if this is all there is. How many, in, how many, um, uh, how many advertisements on TV do you ever see to uh, encourage you in a plan for your eternity? You ever heard one? Not unless it's somebody preaching. All you hear is advertisements for building a big uh, retirement fund. Uh, no, change to gold and silver from this or that. And so uh, the one who's going to end life a success is going to be the one who owns the most. That's success. That's life. So that, uh, in other words, they're saying uh, they don't believe there's a life after this earthly one. And they live accordingly. So to them, the only thing that's worth anything has to do with this life, not the next portion of their life. And so that's what he was seeing among these people who were coming to the temple to worship. He was leading them in song, in music, and they were singing and having a big time and worshiping like they uh, were expected to. But in their heart, they were miles away from, what, uh, from who God is and what he was telling man to do to prepare for eternity. That wasn't in their consideration whatsoever. That poisoned them. We look here at um, uh, verses 13 and 16. Three, first, we've already read three. He said in verse three, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. These, bo these boastful people uh, had it made, they said, and they know what's right, and they, they're the ones that uh, are being the successful ones. And, um, and he saw this, and he began to look at him and say, you know what? They are the rich ones. <laughs> they are getting all of the, the best jobs, and they are, they are being the, the uh, well-known names. They're getting famous, and and building beautiful homes and owning three or four cars and go ahead and name all the stuff that people brag about having. That, he was seeing that, and it bothered him. Uh, also in verse, 13, uh, verse uh, 16, he's re he said this, for when I pondered to understand this, he couldn't understand why the unrighteous were getting all the breaks and the righteous weren't. In fact, they were getting disciplined. <laughs> they were getting uh, managed in, a, in such a way that um, they weren't getting earthly rich, but they were, uh, they were being um, challenged and, and um, disciplined by the Lord himself and by brethren who could see that they were walking in the wrong way, right? So he says, when I pondered to understand this, how come God let them have all this and I'm not getting it. I want some of that. You feel like that? Uh, you, want, you want something that um, is like your friends who are considered prosperous? He said, when I pondered this, I was troublesome. I was troublesome in my sight. This bothered him to a point. He, he finally says uh, in verse 17, uh, I'm sorry, uh, until verse 17, he says, you know, they have another time word. He had saw these things. He had pondered these things. He had worried about these things. They had bothered him all the way till this point in time. Until I came into the sanctuary of God. 
Then I perceived, says, their end. What he's meaning is what he saw and what he perceived for all those rich, successful people was they have a destination. And it's not his, the same as his destination. They have a destination that's far different. And he's going to go on to explain his definition of, of his destination. Uh, when he saw this, uh, he said, uh, he pondered it and uh, came to this conclusion that he saw their end uh, and it wasn't an end that he wanted. You know, I'm talking about Asaph. Asaph didn't want the same kind of end they had, that they'd got coming. And he saw what it was and how soon it would come and how thorough uh, it's going to be when it comes. And so um, he uh, made the decision in his heart that where they were going, he didn't want to go. So he began to combine or uh, compare where they were going with where he was going, where his end was. And uh, he began to number these things. And this is where nevertheless come in. Nevertheless, we're going to be in verse 23 and on, following on down. It's only a short section, but it's a section that turns the light on this situation in a way that blows you away when you're a believer. And it should scare you half to death if you're an unbeliever. Because he's put in there in between this thought of the, the wicked are being prosperous and I'm not, he's going to combine that with, that just applies for now. Life is more than just now. You have an end, you have a destination, I have an end, I have a destination. And even before my destination, I've got it made compared to them. Uh, listen to hear what he says. Six things, uh, he says, is what encourages him uh, when he was thinking about, about, about all of the uh, benefits of being an unsaved person compared to the glory that's going to be for the believer. In verses 23 and 24, <clears throat> he basically says this. Nevertheless, in other words, even so, even, what, even so this is the way it is, he goes on to say, nevertheless, I am continually, what does your Bible say? With thee. You know something he's got that the, that the, the lost, the unbeliever, uh, the man of this world uh, doesn't have? He's got the constant abiding presence. You don't even have to ask the Lord to come. To a, to a, a person in God's hands like Asaph, uh, God resides in us today, especially in the church age. Uh, he is with us, uh, and here, this is out of the Old Testament. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. He says, thou hast taken hold of my right hand. See, I have God's presence continually. The unsaved man don't. He doesn't have that benefit. We have that benefit. Are you taking advantage of that benefit? He wants you to. His presence uh, means tremendous things to us. And then he says, Thou hast taken a hold of my right hand. Let me ask you, you're looking at that. Who's holding who here in this verse? He says, Thou hast taken hold. Thou is God. He says, God, you have taken hold of my right hand. And those two English words, taken hold, comes out of an original word that means to grasp. Not just to kind of hold hands. To grasp. A firm grasp. He says, thou, God is the one who takes us by the right hand. And he takes us in a firm way. Thou hast taken hold of my hand because I'm going to slip. <laughs> I'm going to falter. And with I've got his hand holding me, I'm not going to fall to the ground. The wicked 
fall to the ground. The righteous get snatched up by the grasp of the Almighty One. That's a tremendous difference. Who falls then? Who will hit the? Who will get injured? Who will fall and be uh, be harmed by it? The, the the wicked man, the un, the worldly man, but not to those who have God holding them up. He says also, uh, "I've always had you with me." Uh, and in Hebrews we read uh, in chapter thirteen, he tells us to be to be content with that, with what we have. And he says, we're to be content with that because uh, he n will never, ever leave us or forsake us. That's what it tells you right there in Hebrews. It goes right along with that first thing, that he is with me. And he's with the, uh, the godly always. What a, what a benefit, huh? Uh, what a nevertheless. The Lord is my helper. I'll not be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. He's constantly with me. Never leaves me. I never have to call him to come. He's always with me. He goes on to also to say in verse 23 that, uh, uh, that he has taken hold of, the, of me by uh, gripping my right hand. Um, you see, um, when, when, I get, when I trip up, and I do trip up, and I do come short, but instead of falling down and, and being harmed, that grip keeps me from going down. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God, do you believe that the psalmist is right? That God has the righteous under his control? He's safe? The, the righteous are safe. And he goes on to say also uh, in the next verse, verse 24, that he is, uh, counsels me. 24, with thy counsel. Thou wilt guide me with thy counsel that will guide, will guide. <laughs> you need someone to help you understand a situation, someone to give you information on where to go next and how to do it. You need, you need someone to help you, to teach you, to counsel you, to give you advice. Well, you know, that's one of your benefits as a, as a righteous individual is that you have that with you he is always with you. He's got you gripped in his right hand and he counsels you. That is, he guides you. He guides us uh, uh, as we travel through our path in this life. Um, Paul, writing to the Philippians at one point, he said to them uh, that uh, um, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in me and who would that be, by the way? Would that not be the Holy Spirit? And God, as he uh, works in your heart and draws you to himself and takes up residence within, Paul said to them uh, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it, that is, complete it, until the day of Christ Jesus. When's the day of Christ Jesus? The day of Christ Jesus is looking forward, that phrase looks forward to the return of Christ for the church, for the rapture, and uh, for uh, what follows that. The day, of, the day of Christ is he's saying that uh, he will perfect his, what he began in you and began in me. He's going to keep working and perfecting it until it's completed when he calls me home. Whether it's at the day of the rapture or if it's the day when he calls me home from this life. Uh, does that give you any encouragement? He says when he, when he begins something, he finishes it. He's not like so many who will start something and then quit. When it comes to you as an individual, God says he, he starts it and he never drops it. You might make it hard on yourself, you know, if you don't follow his, his uh, counsel and you don't let him lead you in your life, you'll bear the benefit if you want to call it that, the results of living like that, but he's ready to counsel you and lead you right if you'll obey and uh, not have to, you can make it hard on yourself if you want to, but he's not going to quit on you until glory. I find that amazingly encouraging. So uh, if you want to know how all this works, 
uh, I would encourage you this afternoon to pull up your Bible and look at the first nine verses in uh, um, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, can I summarize it just in my own words? He tells there's three things that will uh, make this a reality in your life. Three things. One, stay close to him. A lot of times we get in trouble because we don't do that. He says, stay close to me. Keep short accounts with me. Uh, secondly, pray about everything. Uh, Praying about everything means keeping his presence with you uh, in your awareness. Live with him because he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Whether you're aware of what he's doing in you at that moment doesn't matter. He's there and uh, he's never going away. So pray about it. He's right there available. Talk to him. Pray about everything. And he says if you do that, you'll solve your problem of worry. One of the reasons we worry is because we don't trust him. We don't commit our problems to him. We try to take care of ourselves. Boy, do we get in trouble, right? So the third thing is keep my thoughts under his control. And uh, with that, uh, then he says, he'll live with me like that throughout my whole life. I'm going to finish here with just a couple uh, short things. One is, he says in verse 4, that when he gets done leading you in your life and counseling you and taking care of you and from falling and he teaching you wisdom and working in your life, he says, when I'm done doing that and the time has come, he said in verse 4 that uh, he says, I'm sorry, not verse 4, verse uh, 24, with thy, uh, thou will guide me and afterward, after you're done guiding me, in other words, after this life is on earth is over for me, afterward, you will receive me to glory. <laughs> Guaranteed. What do you think of that? That's an enormous benefit that, that the, uh, the uh, wicked don't have. The world doesn't have that assurance. They don't have any of these things. So Asaph was beginning to see the light. He's beginning to see what a blessed individual he is with all these benefits from the true and the living God, he said, why was I jealous of, of what they've got? Whatever, even if they get millions of dollars and, and have great success outwardly, as soon as they die, none of it's going with them. It's staying here for somebody else to spend or do, deal with, and he will end up in, in uh, judgment. He'll end up in Hades. So... Um, he says here, he'll re me, he'll receive me. And it tells us that also uh, in several other places in Scripture that we will be received, period, will be received. So the nevertheless is um, uh, the other side of the story. Yeah, we're, we're living in a time of, of difficulties and troubles and trials. Nevertheless... <laughs> I've got the God who has a relationship with me in these six very special ways that means, uh, means I'm on the right side. I'm on the side of glory. I've got all the benefits. All they have is a, a few benefits for, for this time, and then, it, then they lose it. My benefits go on forever and ever in, on into eternity. Verses 25 through 8 will be done. Whom have I in heaven but thee? The psalmist is saying, who else in, in the heavens can come and help me? Nobody. There's nobody. There's people up there that love me. They went on before me. They love me. But I don't have anybody else in heaven who will come and help me. Only him. He says, whom have I in heaven but thee? And he said, besides thee, I don't desire anything on earth. You're all I need. You're all I need. I don't need anyone or anything else. My flesh and my heart may fail. It will. We'll, we'll come short. We'll miss the mark. But, or we could say, nevertheless, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What I, what I lack, what I lack, God provides. 
I don't have to worry about a thing. He's got everything I need. Everything, I don't want anything else. For behold, those who are far from thee will perish. Thou hast destroyed all those who are unfaithful to thee. And then he finishes up with his final thought at the end of this dual uh, session of, of, uh, of uh, Asaph's issues. He says, as for me, in verse 28, uh, the nearness of God is my good. His presence right here, and he says it's here. Even in the Old Testament, his presence was there and would never leave or forsake his own. And he said here, uh, but as for me, that nearness of God to me is good. You know, some people would think that God's nearness was a shame or, or, or something that they don't want. Hey, if you really know the true and the living God, you'll want. Would you want, to want all of these six things that he just brought to our attention? I'll name them once more as we quit. But as for me, the nearness of God's my good. I've made the Lord God my refuge. When my trouble gets me, I run with it to him. I don't go to the psychiatrist. I don't go to my buddies. I have, when I have a, a problem, I run with it. But I go with it to him. He might lead me to go somewhere else that he's working through, but you go, you take it to him. And a lot of times we don't do that. We, we bring God in on the problem last after everything else has failed. Then we pray, God help me. That's upside down and backwards. The very first place we ought to go to God with a problem is him and let him lead from that point on. So um, he says in verse 28, the nearness of God is my good. I've made the Lord God my refuge, my hiding place. And he says that I may tell of all thy works because what God does in my life when I commit it to him will bring him honor and glory and bring me blessings beyond my ability to comprehend. He's enormous, and what he offers uh, is uh, beyond value. Nevertheless, six things uh, that I was mentioning here, and then we'll pray and be done, uh, is this, that um, God is always with me. Two, he has a grip on my right hand. Three, he counsels me through life. Four, he will welcome me when this life is over. He will welcome me to glory. And five, he's my only heavenly resource. Be thankful that you have a resource located in the heavenlies. And six, my flesh, my heart may fail, but God will make up the difference. What do you think? Would you side with Asaph? As for me, I'm going to go God's way. And it's eternally the best way there is to go. If you don't know him, today's the day. You don't know if you got tomorrow. Uh, if, you don't ha if you want these kind of blessings from the Lord, you've got to be uh, born from above. You've got to have his life within you. He's got to, because he's the doer of it. We're the, the recipients of it. And we are the ones who respond to what he does in us. But that relationship is only going to be a reality if you ask him for it. He's paid the price. Now all he wants you to do is he's given his life for you and, and he wants to give his life to you if you will receive it. Do that this morning if you haven't already done. And if you want to do that, want to talk to somebody, we've got plenty here, just mention it to the, any of the believers here that you see. You can ask me uh, to pray with you. But uh, you, you just need to do business with the Lord God himself, and he will make it happen. Let's pray. Lord, what can we say except you offer the best for time and eternity? And we're grateful that you have put it in written form that we can read and study. But even better, we can accept it. We can turn our life over to you and let you have your way and in the process, 
Not only will we be blessed, but so will many others that you touch through us. You're great, you're wonderful, and the world needs to know you. Help us to do a better job of revealing you day by day to those we rub shoulders with. We ask it in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. We'll sing one song to, in leaving. And that song uh, is one I hope you can sing from your heart uh, it, because it's a reality. It's the song, I am his and he is mine. So let's stand together, just sing a couple verses. Words are on the screen. some fruit and honor and glorify him. Have a good day.